I've recently reread my dialogues after three years. And I freely concede that in several places a reader ignorant of my real purposes could suppose several arguments might suggest real conviction on my part. My error, I confess, was one of ambition. The natural inclination of most men with regard to their subtleties to show themselves more skillful than other men in devising arguments in favor of propositions. Even false propositions. Galileo was remanded to a small room in the Palace of the Inquisition. It seemed certain that his dialogue would be banned. The question now became, what punishment would befall Galileo himself? It very quickly boiled down to a technicality. In 1616, Galileo had agreed not to teach or defend the Copernican theory the accusation was he had violated this agreement. And Galileo said, no, I didn't violate the agreement. Uh, if you see, by the time you read the end of the book, I come out in favor of the church's position, and I just bring up these other arguments as an arguing tool. Well, anybody who read the book know better. News of Galileo's confinement reached Maria Celeste and she nervously sent off a letter of cautious advice, not knowing if it would ever get to her father. Detained in the chambers of the Holy Office. I have given no hint of these difficulties to anyone else, wanting to keep the unpleasant news to myself. Father, now it is the time to avail yourself of that prudence which the Lord God has granted you. The path Galileo followed to the chambers where he would hear his sentence led through the cloisters of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. The walls and ceiling warned heretics what fate might await them. The people who were conducting the Inquisition hope that anybody who's coming into the Inquisition sees these scenes of people who've died in the correct faith realized that they should use the courage of the martyrs to confront their own case, face their heresy squarely, and go off to their punishment with a clean conscience because it's been brought back to orthodoxy. On the morning of his sentencing, Galileo was once more brought before the Inquisition, this time wearing the white robes of a penitent. We pronounce sentence. We declare that you, Galileo Galilei, by reason of the matters detailed in this trial, have rendered yourself in the judgment of this holy office vehemently suspected of heresy. Namely, having held and believed a doctrine which is false and contrary to Scripture, that the sun is the center of the world and does not move, that the earth is not the center of the world and does move, we condemn you to formal imprisonment in this holy office at our pleasure. a settlement was likely worked out. Galileo was given a chance to renounce his errors. Rather than spending the rest of his life in a dungeon, the old man knelt as ordered. I, Galileo, son of Vincenzo, Galilei, Florentine, 
70 years of age, kneeling before you, swear that I have always believed. I believe now, and with God's help, I will always believe all that has been taught, held, and preached by the Holy Catholic Church. I abjure with unfeigned faith and sincere heart. I curse and detest many errors and heresies. So help me God. Amen. The trial of Galileo was over. Waiting in the Tuscan embassy, he would not know for months when he would be allowed to return home. Dialogue on the two chief systems of the world was added to the index of prohibited books. It would remain banned for the next 200 years. Galileo had believed that Pope Urban VIII would protect him from censure, but the Pope had not. Being the Pope is different from being the Cardinal. The Pope had many battles to fight, the most important being the Protestant Reformation. And there he was, the head of the Catholic Counter-Reformation, and Urban was actually accused of not doing the right things to further the Catholic cause. The Pope maintained interest in what Galileo was doing. But the Pope, in many ways, had other concerns besides science. Urban VIII is facing the Thirty Years' War. The entire reign is under the shadow of a terrible, vicious civil war that's tearing apart the Christian world. So when Galileo came to trial, the Pope could not risk defending his friend when he personally was under such scrutiny. And Galileo became expendable. He feels he can afford to turn his back on Galileo, and I think Galileo didn't know what was coming. Tuscany at that point has nothing but culture. Galileo is their vanguard of scientific thought. Galileo gets silenced by the Pope. So it's a Tuscan <laughs> turning back and smacking his Tuscan friend, who he feels smacked him at the end of this dialogue, so that it's a wonderful Florentine vendetta. Six months after his trial, news arrived in Florence that Galileo would finally be allowed to return home. It had taken the pleas of the Tuscan ambassador, the intervention of the Medici family, and the quiet influence of his own daughter. We are awaiting your arrival with great longing, and we cheer ourselves to see how the weather has cleared for your journey. Sire, my sudden joy is as great as it is unexpected. Galileo was home, but confined to his own house, unable to teach, travel, or even visit his daughter without permission. He signed his letters, from my prison in Arcetri. He was under house arrest. He could not move without authorization. And also what he could do, what he could not do, was dictated by the church. Not so many years have passed since I was often received by cardinals and princes of the city who wanted to see only for a moment some of the things that I had observed. Latin orations were occasionally recited in honor of me. The Duke's mathematician, discoverer of new planets, eyewitness of wonders unknown to the ancient philosophers, 
but no. <sighs> Now, I spend fruitless days made long by inactivity, yet brief, compared to the years that have passed. My only comfort, the memory of former friendships, of which so few remain. <laughs> 